Hi, this is Dick DeAngelis. I'm um, bringing this presentation to you live from Fairfield Media Center. And we're here today with uh, Christine Essel, the Jefferson County Public Health Administrator. And uh, also with us is Brett Farrell, the Emergency Management Coordinator for Jefferson County. Um, we First of all, I just want to start by uh, uh, saying that Erica Richards, who usually does this, wasn't able to today, but uh, I am uh, wanted to thank you for the work you're doing and the work for all the healthcare professionals and um, and people all over town that are that are kind of pitching in and being a part of this thing. Uh, I know that both of you don't need to hear this, and sometimes maybe you know, uh, but I'm going to tell you anyway. People in in this town and in this county don't always realize who's there and who's got our backs until a situation like this comes up. And, uh, and just from my side, I just want to say thanks for being there and for doing all the work you do that most people don't even know you do until a situation again like this kind of rears its head. So uh, hopefully we won't know what you do again for a long time after this. That means that everything's going smoothly, but, uh, it's sure great to, to know you're there and uh, and care so much about our community. So uh, thanks. You're very um, welcome. Thank you for having both Brett and I this morning. So anyway, I, I think what I'd like to do is start by just asking you a few questions. And then maybe at, at the end of that, you can also tell us some other things, unless there's something you feel is really important to start out with that uh, that you want to announce or something. No, I, I'm fine with questions to start off with. But Brett, your candidacy for governor or anything like that? <laughs> governor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so know, see, speaking, speaking of governor, why don't I start there, I guess, is that um, I'd like to know how the changes that are coming into place for, uh, in particular for Jefferson County, we've got, last I heard we had seven cases. Is that still the case? That is correct. We are at seven lab confirmed cases. I know the state's web page says six. However, it truly is seven. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I guess, you know, in talking to people, I guess the feeling is one of relief. Like, wow, we were worried it could be 50 by now or, or more. And um, seven isn't good, but it's not too, too shabby right now, I guess, is the general feeling. And yet there seems to be this feeling from some of like impending doom, like, okay, it's sweeping across the country, it could be hitting us any minute. Or there's also the feeling like, hey, we may have dodged a bullet due to all the good work that everyone's been doing. And maybe this thing isn't going to swing around until the winter. And by then, who knows, there might be things that are available to us that, that might help us uh, kind of deal with it. The, 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 and I'm trying to figure out which is accurate. <laughs> and then also uh, kind of, I guess a lot of people feel like, do we have seven? We have seven confirmed cases. I know you're always careful to say that. Yes, I am. How, how many people have it that are asymptomatic or whatever in our county. So I'm just wondering if you could kind of express at least what the thinking is uh, from our professionals here, Christine. Sure. Um, it's been an interesting last several months, I have to say. Um, every day we listen to what the governor's recommendations are and um, the changes that she's uh, implementing. I will say, uh, a source of frustration for me as the local public health administrator is that we are not given a heads up on any information. So last week when she rolled out Test Iowa, um, we heard it at the same time the rest of the state heard it. Not that I think that we're privy to top secret confidential information, but as a local public health administrator, I would... Um, expect a different level of information maybe. So then we're better prepared to answer questions on the local level. I know then when situations like that arise, it causes a lot of a curiosity, a lot of questions and a lot of frustration when you don't have the information to share with other people. Um, so that 
I don't want to get on a soapbox, but that I just want everyone to know I'm not privy to any information prior to her speaking. Um, the other thing, I know that she, the governor, is doing, um, uh, looking at the state and regions, and not every state does that. Uh, regions for us and, and a local health department level is, is kind of business as normal. We're, we participate in lots of different things at the state level, and um, we have different groups of people that we participate in different activities with. But the uh, regional centers that she has lined up for this uh, pandemic are a little different than what we've seen in the past. Um, we've had um, different regions for healthcare preparedness grants and um, that region has grown a little bit. So I'm assuming after this, this pandemic is over, those individual counties will be what we would consider region five. And she refers to that on, uh, on her daily briefings most of the time. Um, so I will say it's, it's interesting to see her say one thing, but then at the same time, it's almost a conflicting data or conflicting information coming out. And that's the way it is for us as healthcare providers too. I understand opening up elective surgeries. I understand individuals needing surgery and knee replacement, something like that that is, that is important for patient care, but it's not a life-saving type of surgery or intervention. With that being said, you need personal protective equipment for elective surgeries, just like you do a trauma surgery. And we are currently under uh, an issued PPE shortage. So it's kind of like, we're gonna say one thing and do something else. So I, I understand people's frustration and mixed messages. And I know we like to have the information and we don't want the information to change. We want to know what we're doing. If we're playing football, we want the same rules. We don't want to play by soccer rules or baseball rules. We want the same rules every day. And unfortunately, that's not the way it is in a pandemic. We, uh, we see things and we try to do things differently to mitigate the spread and to um, have access to those individuals that need access. Does that make sense, Dick? Yeah, yeah. I guess I have a question maybe for you, Brett. Uh, how, how's the PPE situation in Jefferson County? Um, and, and I guess uh, whoever wants to take it, then we would follow up by saying how, well, why don't we deal with testing later? PPEs, I guess, are, are I guess everybody's question, uh, God forbid something really were to, to more substantially take place. How, how are we doing? We're doing good. Um, we've, <clears throat> fortunately, we haven't had, you know, the hospitals haven't been um, overwhelmed because we haven't had really very many cases in that hospital. You know, the surgeries, elective surgeries haven't been happening. So we're good on PPE right now. We continue to order it. And I think that is, I, I understand the question because we hear it all the time. I see it on Facebook. Well, this place doesn't have enough personal protective equipment. You know, that's coming from employees or, or relatives. But I can say that's not true. I'm in direct contact with the hospital, our first responders, the nursing homes, almost on a daily basis asking them, you know, what do you need? Uh, I just gave some masks um, from our inventory to uh, um, one of the care facilities yesterday. I've got another delivery to another one today. So we have the PPE right now and um, we continue to order it. We've kind of backed off and ordered uh, um, some, and like I said, we haven't been hit as hard as some other counties, so our PP is in good shape now, and there's lots of great people making homemade stuff out there. Um, you know, I don't, uh, Chris's group and, and Connie Boyer and, and some of them are the ones that deal with that. I, I, I just directly work with the state web EOC on ordering um, PP through the, um, through the state. Hey, Brett, let me ask you something. Thank you for that. Um, it, I guess the feeling is, okay, if some, there were an emergency here where there was an outbreak of some kind, I guess this is, you know, you don't want to ask these questions and get too weird about it, but if there were, how, how quickly could you get PPEs if you request them? Let's say there's a, a kind of run if you're on the bank kind of thing for PPEs. What the, right now, based on the situation, are there some in Iowa that you could tap into and get here fairly quickly? Yeah, sure. Right now, the way we order it, and this comes down from Homeland Security Emergency Management, you know, we look out with all these facilities on a seven, 10-day uh, 
usage. Uh, and the last time I ordered, I ordered on a Monday and it was here delivered by the National Guard on a Wednesday. If for some reason we would need to do that, uh, we can put in an emergency order and, um, you know, just put that in, in the writing to the state and uh, we would get it fairly quickly. So um, luckily we have to do that, but we do have the access to that. There is a little bit of a shortfall, but we haven't, we haven't um, seen that on our end. Great. Well, I guess um, do, uh, in the facilities, I, I guess everybody is also happy to hear that our senior centers or senior care facilities, knock on wood, seem to be doing pretty good uh, right now. And um, I think that, that has to do with uh, preparedness from everybody's side, but also the, I guess we should take a second to thank the staff that are working in those facilities doing the job that they're doing. So um, I, I know a lot of them and I know how hard they work to keep our seniors safe. Can you give us, fill us in on how things are going there? Sure. I mean, Chris or I can go. I do, I, and Chris would say the same thing on, you know, we have great people that are running these facilities. And uh, it, I think it helped, back to your original question, are we lucky or did, have we been doing things? And I, and I would think our county is, have done the right things um, earlier before this actually hit here in the United States by having several meetings, community partner meetings, planning meetings, exercising, going over some of these things, not to this, not to this uh, scale, but uh, the park views, the Sunny Brooks, you know, people like that, the hospital, public health, emergency management, all been getting together for, you know, three or four years now. Uh, sometimes on a monthly basis and, and doing some of these exercises and planning on if we had overflows in these facilities, if we had to move patients, if we had to do this or that, that. So I think we were kind of ahead of the game on that end as far as the planning goes, but the, but the nursing homes and the care facilities shut down really early here, which was a big help. Um, and, and, and that's, that's a tribute to, you know, Chris's, um, you know, what she's been through and, and the knowledge and the people that are running those facilities and making sure that they were doing the right thing early and, you know, I'm not saying that it's not going to happen here, but I know that that's helped us out tremendously here just because of the people we have in, in place and the people that came to, the, to, to play in these exercises and these plannings. You know, we have great healthcare professionals in, in here that are um, passionate about what they do. They were involved. Um, our public health, obviously, our elected officials, you know, law enforcement. Um, we're at some of these planning meetings and um, you know, another thing is our business leaders in this community have done what they need to do and are doing a good job out there in their businesses. So we just, we're lucky to live in the community like we do. And I think that's helped out our situation tremendously. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Brett. You know, um, Christine, maybe you could give us an idea as those people that are at risk, so to speak, and um, maybe you could kind of go through that and what you see they need to do as the state kind of opens up a little bit. Sure. Um, maybe you could kind of go over that because I, I know some people are itching to get out and kind of experience life as normal, uh, quote unquote. And then other people are like really concerned that either they're going to contribute to something bad for our community or, or they themselves or their families could be at risk. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you think people should do as things open up. Right. Well, that's a great question. And I will say that uh, Brett and I've had this conversation too about life going to back to normal or what it's going to look like. And, uh, you know, we don't know exactly and we don't know when exactly. I'm just as frustrated probably as everybody else not being able to get my hair cut. You know, this will be the third haircut that I've missed just this week that in three months and you don't realize how you look forward to those things and and life as normal as we know it. So, um, to answer your question, though, as far as um, if you have any type of comorbidity, meaning you have um, an underlying disease process or you're at risk or you're taking medications that suppress your immune system um, or you um, have breathing problems, seasonal, even seasonal allergies sometimes can cause other complications based on the medications that you're taking. So if you have any of those, those issues or if you live with someone under the same roof that has those issues, I would encourage you to continue to follow the guidance as far as 
you know, being, you know, socially removing yourself from situations, limiting your trips to the store, practicing good hand washing, all of those things. And um, it's funny how we think about how many times we touch our face and we don't even realize we're doing it. And it's like, I, I'm watching you guys and you guys have both touched your faces since we've been, and I have too, but I have my little hand sanitizer here. But it's just, a, it's to bring an awareness to how many times and how many germs we bring to our face and how we can contaminate ourselves, so to speak. So again, it goes without saying, if, if you're, good job, <laughs> if you have an underlying health issue, you have to be hyper vigilant. You really do. And that's not to spread fear. That's, to, that's a factual statement. You want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to be as healthy as you can. Okay. So on the other side, I know I've been going for my uh, daily ride on my tricycle that, that um, I've, I've become notorious for, but yes, I've been, I've been trying to get in two miles a day to try to just build up my strength and immune system in general. Um, and I have a, a question because I, I, I see people, I wave at them, but I don't engage with them close up right. uh, as the Italian hugger that I am. I, I, I backed off of that for a while at least. And I, you know, just say, hi, it's nice to see, you know, see somebody 10 or 15 feet away from you. Uh, and then I move on and keep going. Is that, right. is that the kind of thing that you're encouraging? Because people are starting to get outside. Today's a little cold, but, but normally, you know, it's, it's been moving into the 60s and 70s and people are wanting to be outside normally. You know, it's just. Absolutely. And that's nature. so it, and it's so good for us, you know, whether you want to go out in the timber and, you know, if you hunt, hunt mushrooms, fish, I like to fish, I haven't been able to do that yet. But yes, get outside, enjoy those activities. But just remember, try not to be in a whole group or a whole pack of people. You still need to practice social distancing the best you can. And, um, but it is important to get outside and, and uh, it'll make you feel better mentally and emotionally. And so that's very, very important. If you're going to go to a garden center, though, um, I would encourage you to try to go at non-peak hours because everybody wants to go to the, the greenhouses, which is great. They're, it's a beautiful place to go. Just try not to go when there's a bunch of other people. And I know that the owners of, of um, those places are trying to mitigate and do the best they can to control how many people are coming in and out. You know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up Maharishi International University because I know that they were getting a lot of heat on the social media locally, and yet I haven't seen the concern that people had, which was that there was going to be a huge outbreak centering there with people from other countries and so on. Maybe you could give us the facts uh, as to what your relationship is with those, uh, the people there on campus and, um, and, and how they're doing. Well, uh, Brett and I both have uh, had a lot of contact with uh, Avina Miller, who is the campus nurse that uh, we work with. Um, and I will say that we had numerous conversations in January before any of this even hit anybody's radar in Iowa. And um, I can I sing her praises constantly because she has done an amazing job working with international students. And MIU is like any other international university. You have people coming and going. You have, you know, changes in semesters. And it's just very migrant. And that's the way college, college life is. And um, she's done an amazing job. I will say that we've had, um, we had a special board of health meeting um, with Dr. Heglin, um, Bill Goldstein, uh, Vina Miller, the mayor, um, a county attorney, and we looked at the things that they had in place, the things that they were doing to mitigate. So I cannot say a, a, enough positive things for the university and the mitigation practices that they put in place early on, way early. So, and that is exactly why you're not seeing um, the numbers like you would expect to see. That's one of the, that's one of the great things that we've done that you know, if, if public health is doing their job, you don't see outbreaks, you don't see spikes. And that's not to say that the counties that haven't increased, that they're not doing their job, but the goal of public health is to decrease the spread of illness and communicable disease. And, and you give those people the skills and the information up front. So in a disaster, in a response, 
they don't have to come to Brett and I because they know what's going on because we've had that conversation previously. So I, I can't say enough great things about our college partners, um, well, especially kudos, with the influx of students. Kudos to you guys for helping them prepare and, and, and for them to be responsive to, I think, some concerns that people had and at least making sure that they were on that, that uh, track. So uh, right. that's right. great great news and great to hear because I, we're all in this together, as they say, right? We absolutely are. We are. So um, maybe we could kind of take the next time, uh, um, Christine and, and Brett, anything that you want the community to know, especially as we're approaching this time where things are opening up a little bit, um, I heard a, heard a friend tell me we may be able to play baseball at some time in the future, but nobody can tag anybody out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just have to only only force plays. That's it. You know. <laughs> it, so I thought that, that was good. It, that's a good one. Everybody has made so many sacrifices, and I just can't thank everyone enough. I know sometimes that that sounds like you know, yeah, right. Like she doesn't care about that. She's just saying thank you. But from the bottom of my heart, I do thank all of our community for, you know, doing what they need to do to try to mitigate the spread. I know that we're still going to have changes. Things aren't still back to normal. It's not what we want. It's not what we expect, but it's what we have to do right now. Um, I just want to touch on this right quick. And I do, I do have a meeting later with uh, our county attorney just to make sure everything um, is going okay. I know that uh, you know, we have a primary election coming up. This is a, this is a question that has been um, asked of me. I am going to continue the order for the courthouse closure until the 15th of May. It is within my limits as the public health administrator under my jurisdiction to make that decision. And I'm going to continue that order until May 15th. Now, with that being said, every department in the courthouse is accessible. All you have to do is call the number for the respective department and somebody will come and let you in. Voting will also be allowed. Um, so it's, you're not going to go without your right to vote. That's not what we're doing. We're trying to alleviate uh, mass quantities of people entering into the building where then, then in turn the courthouse employees would have to mitigate the crowd control basically. So we're trying to um, and make sure everybody's aware of that. I will be issuing that later. It's actually probably tomorrow I'll issue that. So it's effective then uh, immediately. I got my absentee ballot thing yesterday too. Yeah, I think all of us, see, many of us got these yesterday in the mail and that's another route to go for it you is. to vote safely and yet not have to get involved in that, those interactions. So if yes. you act on this now and request a vote by um, mail or absentee, what they used to call absentee voting. Uh, you'll be able to put in your vote, which I always highly recommend to people to do. Get involved and by voting for sure, and and then um, and then do it remotely so so that everybody keeps safe and only those that really need to get in there um, that can do so. So it might be a little different. I know I've always gone to the polling place. Right. And voted. I just always liked that. But you know what? This time I'm going to send in and just uh, request it and uh, have my vote counted that way. Yeah. Yeah. Brett, so any, oh, I'm sorry, Christine, go ahead. You know, I just wanted to touch on that and just make sure that you, you guys did hear it from me that the order is going to be extended through May 15th That's and great. that voting will still be accessible. We're not, you know, limiting your right to cast a ballot. So, and I do want to just one, one quick uh, comment, say we are still making, uh, excuse me, we are still coordinating um, material pickup here. We just got some material uh, for, for isolation gowns. So if we do need them, we will have them ready to go. And I'll post something on Facebook later when that material is ready to pick up for our folks that are sewing. Great. Thank you. Any, any, any uh, points that you wanted to make, Christine, about, or, or, or Brett, about testing? Because I think a lot of people have felt like they might have had certain symptoms called and were told, hey, listen, we're not, we're not testing you right now. And they go, well, I, might, I might have it, I might not, I, I have no idea. And the, I guess the question is, at some point, is there a plan for us to get a gauge of where our, our county stands? Do we only have seven cases, period? Or do we have 20% of the population that's, that's had this? And, and so do you have any read on that? 
I think that once we start doing serology testing, antibody testing, um, meaning, you know, they draw blood and then they look at it under the microscope and see if your body has the antibodies of this virus, meaning you've had the virus, um, we're not going to really know those numbers. And I don't know at this point if, if that's going to be routine practice, or I think it's just going to depend on a lot of variables. I know Test Iowa um, is opening up a second uh, testing site this weekend in Waterloo. Um, I know that it's still limited. I know testing here is still, you can get SHL testing, um, meaning you have to meet the strict criteria, but then your provider can also order it and you can pay out of pocket for the testing. Um, so there's still options for the testing. I, but again, a test confirmation is just a snapshot in time. And, and I think people are still getting hung up on, on that yes or no positive or negative test result. And so I, if, you, I, if, if, if they're testing you, you may have had it, but don't have it now, or you may right. not have it, but you may get it tomorrow. That's exactly right. But if they're testing you for whether you have the antibodies, that's something that stays with you. Yes. So that when that test becomes either a lot easier to do, or, um, or, or possibly um, a, accessible. Mm -hmm. a, a more accessible in some way, then, then we might have a better picture. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. And then um, uh, I do want to, uh, Brett, do you have anything you want to add before we finish up? No, I just, I guess I would like to say, you know, if things starting to reopen a little bit that I just, you know, stress that everybody continue to do what they should be doing. The, the distancing, you know, um, I think everybody's kind of eager to get back to normal and, and, and that'll happen at some point, but, you know, I, we worked really hard, um, here trying to mitigate this whole process. And, you know, we still, and my job is to plan for the worst and we're still planning. Um, we still have plans in place in case it goes south here. Um, a lot of plans in place, but, um, we don't want to have to use those plans. So, you know, with the reopening a little bit, I would say that um, people continue to wash their hands, do the social distancing, do what they're supposed to do if they're out and about. So we don't get to that point. Uh, we've worked and, and everybody in this community has worked you know, re really hard to, to see it um, turn into something a lot worse than it is now. And, you know, public health, I can't say enough about Chris and her staff. Again, um, we, I spent a lot of time with them in the last two months and, uh, <laughs> at, our, at our emergency operations center up there. And, and uh, you know, public health, it's kind of like emergency management, public health, not a lot of people recognize what they do until situations like this and, and realize the importance of what, what Chris and her staff do on a daily basis. And I've seen it firsthand. So uh, I just, you know, let the community know that they, they're great people and doing, doing great things for this community. They are, and we're really appreciative, both the public health uh, administrator, uh, Christine Essel, and your staff, and Brett, for the work you do in the emergency management team. Um, can't tell you how much it's appreciated. I also want to take a second to thank Jason Strong and the Fairfield Media Center yeah. for providing this. Jason is going out under um, some tough conditions to make sure reaching out and connecting people and... Uh, we're, we're really appreciative because that gets the word out to people. You guys for taking the time today. Thanks a lot. Uh, we know you're busy, but I think this helps because people get to see it and relax at home and actually hear the answers uh, straight from the lion's mouth, as they say. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank Thanks you. for being with us. Thank, Thank you, Dick. All right. Thank you very much.